Om Shri Padme Om. Oh. Ah, bong, bong, bong. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, um, hello everybody. Um, we continue our interviews. The, the previous interview I did about five years ago. And this interview is unique because first it's, it's physically, locally in the same place. Uh, I'm visiting Dr. Miller at his house. In Oregon, and uh, home. Sec at his uh, home in Oregon. <laughs> at his home in Oregon. Yeah, not a house, home. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Sure. Yeah, no, no. And the second, this interview this time will be about science. Uh, and my intention is, we already know Dr. Miller, and uh, we want to focus specifically on uh, the DNA uh, aspect of the science, on DNA hologram aspect of the science. And we have the phone ringing, that's okay? Is the phone ringing? Yeah. I'll see who it is real All quick, right. just briefly, don't mind me. All right. I'll just stick it. Yeah, or we have a little table, I'll go get that table. All right, so we continue. I will cut here. Oh, and we'll, well. We'll continue. So, um, Dr. Richard Allen Miller published uh, a paper, uh, he presented the, the uh, embryonic holography in 1973 and now it's many years later about 47 years later <laughs> I, I published my paper which references it and actually pro provides some proof for that theory and um, his paper wasn't it wasn't published right away it took like about 20 what years to publish. What happened exactly was that I presented it at Claremont um, you know a religious college and I did two pro I presented two papers. Uh, one was Project Parafile, which was a artificial intelligent computer that I developed on a 360. And uh, that's another story that we can cover. It's very interesting because it was the first AI ever created back in 1973 mm -hmm. when I presented at Claremont in '74. Excuse me. What happened next was one week later. Uh, four men entered my bookstore, placed me under close arrest. Uh, well, two of them held me, two others went through my files, and they classified that paper as top secret. What do you mean classified? They took it away? Yeah. And so the paper that you are seeing was published by a radical friend of mine okay. 20 years later in Psychedelic Monographs and Essays. But you didn't have a copy, so you did write it again? I had to rewrite from memory, which okay. is what I did immediately afterwards. So it's so close to the original that uh, basically it suggested that the DNA was a three-dimensional hologram of force space. Okay. And um, that was the beginning of that construct of holistic holographic and that kind of thing based on my original paper that I presented in Prague in 1972. Um, the military classified it top secret for almost 20 years. And you co-authored this with... Uh, Bert Webb. Bert Webb. Yeah, up in Seattle. And so I talked with Bert and he would be lovely to meet with you if you'd like. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seattle. He's, he and I haven't even been in touch for I think it was like almost 20 years, and a couple of weeks ago we got back in touch because I mentioned that you were coming up to do this interview, and I invited him down if he wanted to be part of it. I I, I, I went to Seattle for a Russian embassy to work on uh, Russian documents, and they closed the embassy right or consulate right then. So now there is no excuse to go to Seattle, but yeah. you know maybe yeah. just to visit Dr. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Let me let me move the camera so you face the camera a little better. Like that. That's fine. Yeah. All right. So the question is, what were your contributions? What did you contribute? What Dr. Webb contribute? What did? What were your contributions? What was your part in making that theory, and what was Dr. Webb's part? The whose part, Bert? Yeah. Bert's. Oh, Bert. Um, we didn't collaborate like that. It would be like you and May having a conversation, uh -huh. and then 
we writing it out together uh -huh. and proofing it together and making sure we had the right words and the vocabulary. And so it was about equal, it was like two yeah, minds working yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Bert was a co-author on the holographic concept with Darden Dixon. Uh, Darden, um, I have no idea what happened to Darden after we wrote that paper. He was mostly our librarian where Bert and I would go back and forth with ideas uh -huh. and Darden would go run out and get the article for us to... Oh, really? Yeah, he was our librarian, you know, but he co-authored the paper because he oh. was part of that. He is not listed there, so... He's, well, <coughs> there are two papers. Okay. There is the holographic concept of reality, which was presented in Prague at the first Psychotronic conference. It was also published in Gordon and Breach. Okay. Uh, and I have that book downstairs on, uh, by Dr. Stanley Krippner, who okay. was my mentor at that time. He uh, is the one that introduced me to Edgar Mitchell, and so I could be at Mission Control in 1971 to do all the ESP studies. I had to... Mission Control of what? At When Edgar Mitchell did his space... Oh, space thing. Yeah, at, at got Cape it, Canaveral. Got it, got it, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I was at Mission Control to do the studies, okay. the ESP, with James Hurtak and uh, Theodore Pierkos and several others. That How we, old were you? Uh, 70, uh, 71. I was just out of graduate school. Uh, I don't know, I was born in 44, so I don't know. How old am I? Okay. Yeah, 28, so, 29, so, 30, somewhere okay. in there. So yeah. you were already, like, I was a, a pretty prodigy. Much. Uh -huh. um, I did code and could do things, you know, uh -huh. that see things, imaginary things, that okay, didn't necessarily okay. mean they were real, you know, but I saw things other people didn't see. And what that did is give us the next possibility of where we might be able to go. And I'm not always right, you, you know, like a child. Well, you can't do that because the dirt doesn't do this, it does that, you know, that kind of thing. But I was like a child, even for the military back then, and was so useful because when you came to a fork in the road and the sciences would go either direction, I instinctively knew which way to go because of all the Nobel Prize laureates that I got to train under. When, oh, you when trained? I would, Oh, yeah. Uh, they, when they sent me to Princeton, uh, of course, immediately was uh, you know, Roger Penrose. Uh -huh. And then when they sent me to MIT, I had Charlie Muses, I had James, I, I had um, uh, Albert Sense Gorky, I had Edward Everett Horton, I had, you know, all these different Nobel Prize trying to educate me in a level of physics to take that universe and go to the next level with it. And uh, I did. Uh, you know, I went from holographic, I mean, from a quantum mechanical system into a holographic system because space and time aren't real. They're constructs in okay. the way we choose to organize information. And so I, instead of, which has an indeterminacy or um, uh, when you go from a an analog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> just the okay. sound. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. When you go from an analog to a digital system, smoothing and you break it into steps, like your DNA is going to suggest, and I'm going to suggest that it isn't a spiral, it's a spiral staircase with different steps. And because of the different spacing between each step, it isn't smooth. It's digital, and as such, is going to create an uncertainty principle like quantum mechanics because of the smoothness going into the DNA when it's a helix. It's got a point here and a point there and a point there, and it goes around. You have different steps that you're taking. Sometimes the steps are big steps, and sometimes they're small steps predicated on the molecule at that moment that mm -hmm. you're working mm -hmm. around. And that is going to create a difference in possibilities because you're making an assumption that it's quantized. Is it a particle, a wave, mm -hmm. or is it a 
a particle or a wave. And, right, right, right. And if you see it as a wave, then it has an analog component to it. But if you digitize that, then you inject an uncertainty principle, Heisenberg, you know, that would, right. the more that you would know about one part of how that step goes from here to here, the less you know about something else. There's a trade-off there, which means, in fact, you can't get there from here because of our limitation in concepts. And uh, the one I use today that everybody gets is, I say, is the Earth flat or is it round? Mm -hmm. And in physics, before you do anything else, you start with assumed truths, mm -hmm. like the shortest distance between two points mm -hmm. is a straight line. Is that true or not true? Well, today we have evidence to indicate that space is curved because of gravity and other kinds of concepts that we've interjected into the nature of space-time. And if space is curved, I can, with very simple tensor math, prove that the Earth's flat. Now, that's because our construct of space-time is such that it allows those two possibilities based on our assumed truths before we even get to definitions. And so that's where the limitations are in science and why science is not going to have any more answers than religion does. And that's why we have two brains, with Malcoma in the middle. <laughs> you know, like insanity, trying to rationalize the one from the other. And this is where what actually made us God's favored. We had choice. And if you choose to look at it this way, then the earth's flat. And these are the realities that are possible. Falling up over the edge. Uh, if you choose to look at it as round, now you have all these other possibilities in your universe. And so we choose one over the other, predicated on where we want to go. And that's why I would say a Buddhist, for example, could be a Christian, but a Christian could not be a Buddhist. These doors offer less access to the universe than these doors. And so in physics, the key, in my humble opinion, is to have a broader worldview, because the broader your worldview is, the more access you have to it. Because it isn't about laws of physics. That's where we lose the importance of what physics is and what it is not. It uh, will never give us the answer to anything. The tree of life uh, in uh, Kabbalistic systems has only one place in that entire schism of reality where knowledge is wisdom. And that's above uh, Kether, at, you know, the Christ and going Tipperuth, excuse me, going to Tipperuth, Christ consciousness or self realization to God realization. And between those two, it's a missing sephora that's usually in little dots called Doth, D A A T H. What Doth is, is a temporary place. Mm -hmm. uh, a metaphor that I would use is that I come to this roaring river. And without hesitation, I leap out into the center of it and touch on a rock underneath the water that you didn't see, leaping over to the other side, laughing. Mm -hmm. It is a temporary, momentary place. You don't stay there. Okay. Boom, boom, you know, to go to, from here to there. But it is the distinction of knowledge and wisdom. It's called Das, okay. the missing Sephiroth. Now, within all systems, you make assumed truths, and so today we work with holograms, or holistic views of reality, which is based on information 
and the resolution of information, how information resolves out of the next layer from the physical plane, and then you have the emotional plane, how you feel about the physical plane, and above that you have the mental or uh, it's a it's a like a Plato uh, distinguishing a couch from a chair, the difference between the one and the other, which does the same thing. I I'm sorry I'm so animated all the time. I'm oh, like good, a good, little good. kid, and I I'm all over the place. But that place is where your assumptions on how you make assumed truths. And before you even start with definitions of what a space is or time is. Now, going from a quantum mechanical system to a holographic one where you no longer are using space-time as your measurement, you're using information. There's a theorem in information theory that states that if you have enough information to ask a coherent question, you have enough information to answer it. In other words, it's in the framing of the question that determines the next layer. And that next layer might be here, or it might be here, or it's actually right here. Why is it from here to here? Because of the different generators that you would do use, like Mendelbrot, Julia, or May. These are generators that are used in fractal math showing how information collapses down into or out of itself. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing in your model system mm -hmm. is using the DNA as a physical structure. Okay. Uh, Three-dimensional. Yep. Yep. That has information on a fourth level of inf level plane of information and so we have the we have the physical the emotional the causal mm -hmm. the causal plane and then the fourth level would be archetypal and i chose to use timothy leary's neurologic systems mm -hmm. of eight as the way we would break things down mm -hmm. but that's arbitrary Mm -hmm. Just realize it could be based on 11 mm -hmm. string theory, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. has. Mm -hmm. Oh. That's okay. I'll continue. Oh, you're. Yeah. I'm just checking the side. So that I don't get too far out of no, focus. You're good. And, uh, yep, yep, yep. Oh. You good? Yeah. It's, um, it's an unusual universe, and why we have two brains. And because religion, which for me, is fellowship. When you choose a belief system, um, that's arbitrary. Actually, belief systems are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. If you had been born in Pakistan, you would not be a Christian. So, you have choice. And you choose a belief as a tool to take you where you're trying to go. Right. And that's so when you do this genome mm -hmm. project that you're doing yep. with time and space mm -hmm. and or mm -hmm. information, it's a hologram with your proton cloud and all of that, realize those aren't real. They're ways of looking at things that allow you to do that. And if you chose to look at them, differently, it would allow you to do that. Right, right. And so what you're trying to do is become more well. And that's the distinction. Uh, well, meaning physical plane is your health, emotional plane is your emotional security, your archetypal, the fourth level. There's eight levels. Um, we can talk about those later. Neurologic circuits, these give you access to the different layers of possibilities mm -hmm. and but those are arbitrary in terms of ketamine tubbeasy 
would be telepathine, you know, it's a dimethyltryptamine. These neurotransmitters, what they are, one way of looking at them, is that they are specific chemistries that dialogue with the next layer out of awareness. And we have subtle bodies besides the physical body. The physical body is called, look at the bird right there. It wants me to put some food out for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, it talks to me that way. See, it's going to be very insistent that if I put some food out, it has dialogued with me. And has, right. Yeah, isn't that? I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. I just I noticed these things, uh -huh. you know, that which are not necessarily relevant, but give us a richer field of possibilities. And I'm going to suggest that there's probably never going to be a theory of everything. I'm going to suggest that it doesn't work that way. That instead, how about imagination is a reality. I have watched a woman, literally I've seen this happen, rip a car door off to save her daughter in a flaming automobile. Now, that's not possible physics. How did she do that? Right. Um, yeah, let's come back to DNA. Well, so, there's a reason I'm doing this. Okay. Okay. The reason I'm giving you this is that it would suggest that the laws of physics are arbitrary and that they change with altered states of consciousness, which man <clears throat> previously has had a bunch of fear, first enemy of man, studying these altered states. Now, one of the altered states that I developed was with Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. um, I suggested that there was a place right there, not where you are right here, but right there, right here, not up here, not over there, right here, where your ability in guessing was 400 times over where you are right now. Okay. And I validated that, being tested by Duke University, and mm -hmm. where they brought in Gene Dixon and Sybil Leak and others, and I won it by three orders of magnitude, and I'm not psychic. <clears throat> I just understand how to go from one state of consciousness right here where we are in what we mm -hmm. call conscious state, which, by the way, isn't real. It's a dream state. Right. There are lucid dreaming states where you have more content to reality than we do here. Now, this state gives you balance. You know, am I going to get shot? Am I not going to get shot? And chances are, if it's a possibility, then you go to Merlin when he said to Arthur, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. If it's possible, you can count on it. Coming back to DNA. So DNA is and consciousness, right? So in my, in my paper, I propose that DNA is directly linked to, to the brain activity. So the, the genome is directly participating immediately, like in very short periods of time, participating and thinking. Um, through microtubules, so DNA is sort of vibrationally linked to microtubules. What is a microtubule? It is a small protein that has a wrap, so it yeah, has assembly a, of proteins, it's a resonant right. cavity oscillator right. that has some kind of medium inside it, usually structured water. Okay. So how about a subtle body outside the physical body, which we call chi? Mm -hmm. I've watched my sifu <laughs> and knock someone across the room without touching right. him. How does he do that? How does he do that? I mean, how does DNA participate? I mean, to everything you tell, just add DNA. How does DNA participate in that? It is like mycorrhizae in the soil or like your gut. It's a hierarchy sure. of resonant cavity oscillators dialoguing uh -huh. with each other. And then when do they do that, they are outside space and time. Right. Mm -hmm. Which means 
they're absolute. And that means beyond your knowledge. That means you can only experience it. You can't know it. And so what you do is try to know it by defining it in memes or constructs that you understand. But the DNA is a physical body on a metaphorical level. And the emotional plane is how you feel about it, the next level of information. And in terms of DNA, on who you were, who you are, and who you will be, it's the beginning of understanding what consciousness is and what it is not. And am I pantheistic? I believe that the universe is conscious. Of course. I, well, not of course. That's, I, there's no way I can ever prove it. I make an assumption. And that's where we start our process with the assumption you have to go back to the root of, of what you're doing and when you make an assumption what you're doing is setting up a whole series of laws that are arbitrary and that if you did that with awareness now you're performing an act of magic where you're taking psyche into matter and making it real. And that's the part where I think advanced physics is going to flourish this next century, is in the study of these altered states and how one changes the laws of physics. When you look at DNA and you've made an assumption on a proton cloud That's going to allow you to have a certain layer of directions of doors that are going to be available to you. But really, it's like in that Indiana Jones movie, Anything Goes. Where, where do you want to go? And once you've determined where you want to go, that determines the assumptions that you're going to make as tools tools in a toolbox and once you understand that process now you're beginning to move to the next layer of information in terms of how to regulate your your assume, assume truths into definitions of what a proton cloud is and what it is not that part believe this or not is arbitrary and there's some bad news in all of this. Connecting dots is arbitrary. All right. So, um, by nature, I, I, my approach is to feel at home at any situation, just to get used to that. And uh, if I am afraid of it, it will not let me in. But if I feel at home at this situation, it's fine. So, like, like, um, no. like <laughs> with uh, DNA and the other world, like unknown world, it's okay. There is a door, a veil. And I open the door, you close the door. But uh, let's do whatever is possible on this side, like on the side. And I understand it as illusion. So the DNA is an illusion. We are an illusion. It's a construct. But it's a pretty... Uh, nice construct it has a feel and we get used to that construct so in science we can isolate DNA every day and 90 percent of the time we can see it in the tube we can run it on a gel so it's a, a very persistent illusion and uh, why i don't care i just I, I get used to that it's persistent i'm practical so on practical terms we can play with our toys because it gives you immediate access to what you're seeking at that moment. That's the key part. It is the moment where it all happens. It isn't a persistence. It's um, why you would notice 
one thing over five others is filtering. Right. Why would you filter? That's how we operate. Who, how, who operates? <laughs> Wait, oh, man. How, did, how did Tano put it to the Lone Ranger? What do you mean? We white man? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, men in white clothes, yeah. Yes. Well, John <laughs> Bellucci or whatever, you know. Uh, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. Um, I feel that there's something else going on here on why you would want to look at something one way over another. And that thing, that's the place where choice occurs. A hummingbird just came by. They're so interesting. Sorry. I, 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 sure. I notice these little distractions. It turns out that's where the key to choice comes from, are the distractions. And why would you be distracted and one thing over five others mm -hmm. has to do with wounds and the personal choices that okay. we make and taking a wound because a wound is what makes you different than me. Mm -hmm. It's the uniqueness of it. And that means if you can not treat it as a wound but as a tool, mm -hmm. now you're getting closer to purpose. And when you do purpose, you're not able to be seen by an AI. Did you know that? That AI cannot, can only observe you, can get there faster, knowing what you're going to do even faster than you do when you come from a place of wounding. We'll call that intent. That's what happens at okay, the end yeah. of the day. And purpose is slightly different. Okay. And the distinction between the two is when you're able to use the wound as a tool that makes you uniquely different than May. Okay. So your idea of a proton cloud mm -hmm. is going to lead you to what are the possibilities of what that universe will allow you to do. Mm -hmm. Where's it gonna what doors is it gonna open to you for you? That answer is where you start to go from intent to purpose when you ask, what is it going to give me and what do I lose? And once you understand that place, now you have real choice in terms of becoming, how do they put it in the military, become all that you are potentially able of becoming, <laughs> to become more. So your work with DNA, based on my original thoughts, mm -hmm. is going to take mm -hmm. my concepts mm -hmm. to another level, like a footprint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> you want to be more direct with it. No, no, there is lighting problems. There was too much light on the background, so I wanted to oh, I remove the background light. Mm -hmm. I see. Got to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's a video recording. For I public. think that's excellent, by the way. I, I love that quality. That's the one thing I miss is the detail. I am more um, circular. <laughs> <laughs> well, so DNA is circular in many ways. Yes, it, uh, it has its turns. Uh, how about <laughs> DNA, DNA creating consciousness? Uh, speculate on that. Consciousness may not be a thing we can define as much as it is a process. Like Simon would say to you, you can go only halfway to the door. Mm -hmm. What happens is you focus on the door and you never get there. You miss the journey, mm -hmm. the process of going from here to there. And from here to there, by that protocol, it's not possible. You've already set up that only halfway to the door and while you get closer and closer and closer, you never really achieve that mm -hmm. by definition. And yet, there's something else going on there that is where the richness 
of life lives. And that part is the awareness. Now, what is, what is awareness? Well, resonant cavity oscillators, starting with DNA, move that information from this subset to the next subset. Mm -hmm. Like a virus talking to a small grub mm -hmm. in the soil. Mm -hmm. Michael Rives here. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is mycelium mushrooms, mm -hmm. for example, that is the electric circuit. Yes. There is a woman up in UBC um, I, in forestry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that talks about uh, the mother. Would you like me to yeah, climb into the camera next? Yeah, yeah I need uh, because you speak quiet. I need the microphone close. I, 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 oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what kind of camera, Sony? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, my uh, mycorrhizal network is a brain of the planet. Uh, electric, electrical circuit, the nerve trunk, let's say, mm -hmm. that would go from the mother tree to the rest of the forest to notify them an event horizon of an impending storm or a serious weather change. Right, right. And the trees prepare for that based on the networking of what the mycorrhizia, uh, the mycelium, excuse me, is the electrical circuit in the mycorrhizia. Mycorrhizia is the hierarchy, like your gut with your virus talking to your bacteria, your bacteria talking to your one-celled animal and your one-celled animal talking to the multi-celled animal and the multi-celled animal talking to the knee bone and the knee bones connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bones, you know, there is a hierarchy of resonance. That is arbitrary in terms of how you break down your subsystems and uh, like the birds and the bees and the mm -hmm. various constructs of squirrel demanding. My squirrel will look at me and do that to me. Right, right, yeah. Why would he do that? Yeah, the, the even small things, like small living beings, they behave like they are the same consciousness. Imagine that. What do you think that means? I know, I'm thinking that it's just uh, all mirrors. It's one consciousness looking at itself through different mirrors. Well, that's an interesting metaphor. That's an interesting concept. The reflection of itself back and forth so many times the which one's right and which one's left in the reflection of life and death uh -huh. for example isn't that interesting look at that board he is being very oh now his mate is here they probably have little ones to feed and they're not caring about this interview at all. They're more interested. No, no, they in are part of the interview. They're co-creating. Um, they are like little angels helping us. So little angels. Oh, what a beautiful concept. So, <laughs> so uh, another idea is um, the DNA contains base pairs, like lead, uh, steps in the ladder, right? And these base pairs are, are um, the purines have aromatic green, and they have like a big green of six hexagon and pentagon merged with it and um, this structure is present also in uh, many psychedelic and psychoactive drugs and uh, basically most of the drugs that affect consciousness they have that wonderful um, it's called indole structure of hexagon aromatic hexagon and aromatic pentagon with uh, often they are heterocycled so so um, obviously the hypothesis is that somehow these drugs they help DNA to get to gain coherence normally DNA is very messed up and incoherent but when you add a bit of coherence then you get to the higher dimension so can you reflect on that so order is then coming out of chaos it's restructuring itself like a like a uh, information theory uh, where you have uh, a Turing
pairing of, of information evolving itself into itself. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, you know, the idea of consciousness, uh, I think, has many, many faces, like the reflections that you're talking about. And I, I, the part that fascinates me the most about that element is the H302, which is called structured water. Yay. There are many forms of water. There's, you know, um, we start with uh, isotopes, deuterium and tritium. Did you know that deuterium, the ocean between New Zealand and Antarctica, is mostly deuterium? That's where they mine it. It's very, very high, more deuterium than it is normal water. And then you start to restructure the water under boundary conditions like uh, uh, H3O2, which is hydrogen peroxide with a third hydrogen molecule that you bring down. And that's where the memory part comes in, where when it touches something, it creates another periodic chart of relationships so that out of Mendel, Mendeleev's periodic chart, I see a whole series of charts occurring on different elements in terms of hydrogen and oxygen. For example, Willard and or Kerry Reams uh, had um, H709 with a free radical ion that was three water molecules and why when you're near a waterfall, the health in your body is quite different because of the pairing and that free radical ion. And that part in structured water is what makes water so interesting. The so-called fourth phase of water that Jerry Pollack would talk about is quite different on Mars, where the vapor pressure at 100 minus 100 still has a phase four of water, which will not freeze. Now, that's a very interesting concept. Why can water do that where helium doesn't as a molecule? Well, the first rational explanation is that it has a dipole or a dimensional gate to it. It um, can somehow move from here to there, wherever here and there are. And why I'm going to mention that is because when water interfaces with DNA, yes, uh -huh. that's where the magic starts to occur because the DNA's information going from fourth phase of the difference between you becoming an antelope or becoming a human being or becoming a star child mm -hmm. is contained in the access to the water that it's working and um, I think that there's something else going on with the dipole moment of water and its relationship to holograms. I can't tell you how that works yet. I can see it in my mind's eye, but I don't have the words for it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I, I'm, I'm, it doesn't have a word yet. Like we, we call a liquid crystal an amorphous semiconductor when we push it a certain way, we get an electric current that develops out of it. And water is the same way. When we constrain it a certain way, behavior occurs that is unique because of its dipole moment. And I'm suggesting mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. is where the DNA's relationship, remember when I said because it's a helix and it's going down, it's like instead of going down as a smooth roundness, you're going down at different molecules where you steps, step, 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 mm -hmm. step, step. Okay. When you're taking those steps down, predicated on where you are on the DNA, predicates the length of the step, whether it's a short step or a small step. And that functioning with water being compressed 
allows certain kinds of realities to occur. And I think that's where you're going to find your nature of consciousness is in the geometry of allowance in the way it steps down. Uh, so one of the ideas is to bring a Sephirot tree there and find where there is a relationship between DNA water and Sephirot tree. And I think we're going to find it's different on each planet. And that's going to lead us to what we now call cosmobiology out of Prague, going from astrology to astronomy, cosmobiology. We're going to have a different relationship to our construct of space and time. And we're going to have a different relationship to the nature of what information is and what it is not. And information in itself has its own physical structure. That's why we have the different generators and the way they generate. The generators, Mendelbrot, Julia, or May, are the ones that I'm familiar with now mathematically, are the different steps that you would take going down in the different chain of DNA in terms of going from this kind of a step to that kind of a step to this step. Step, 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 step. That sets up a resonance of its own. Yep, yep. And that's where the roots of consciousness lies, is in that variation of steps in the quantization of something analog. Yep, 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 the... Let me show. So there is uh, there are steps, but they are bound by so two steps. They are bound by sugar phosphate sugar. It's called sugar phosphate back, backbone. So when they shift, they shift uh, in discrete optimal state. So it's not just continuum. It's a continuum with certain optimal positions. So the DNA is a ladder which can click, 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 click. And obviously it can click in several positions in one step. It can click on several positions in another step. It can click on several positions in another step. It's nice you mentioned uncertainty. So maybe all these steps coexist at the same time, but... Uh, well, you have the choice right. of choosing which way you want to see the stepping. And that opens those doors and closes those doors as possibilities but they're all available. And that's the part that's very exciting. So that what you conceive of as the possibility of what God is, is only halfway to what God really is, and is what you personally are able to achieve in this lifetime, including immortality, physical, emotional, if you chose the right choices. And at the moment of death, that five gram weight loss of structured water in the microtubule, that's enough to contain over a hundred thousand different lifetimes of choices. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know, they're going to let you know they're here because they want their food. <laughs> uh -huh. They're very insistent. That's working like a dog. We want to know why we feel so drawn to animals like that. Mm -hmm. It's because they're closer to spirit than we are. We're functioning more with our upper brain, which is not the first brain, which is the enteric nervous system or the gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at this point, let's take a break and we'll, we'll, we'll continue shortly. Okay. Is this what you wanted to get? Uh, it worked well. You uh, want it 95% performance rate. <laughs> <laughs>